Welcome back for another episode of Forage Focus. On today's show, we're going to be discussing the basics of pasture grazing rotations. As we head into the springtime and grass growth begins to pick up, we're all excited to see our animals grazing contently on pasture again. Throughout today's episode, we'll discuss the factors we need to consider when setting up those grazing rotations. Stay tuned. When we glance across the pastures looking green and lush with new growth, it's common for us to look at the pasture and just talk about the grass that's in the pasture. But really, what we have is a much more diverse mix of plants. And in most Ohio pastures, those plants include both grasses and legumes. And that's something that's important to note as we move forward in developing our grazing rotations, because grasses and legumes have different parts and they respond differently to grazing. They may also have different required residual heights to come back with good lush green growth after a grazing event. And they also may reach reproductive maturity at a different time, which we're going to talk about more as we move forward and how that affects forage quality. So being familiar with the plants that are growing in our pastures, both what species they are, which categories they fall into, and what types of life cycles they follow on their journey through life can help us make better decisions for grazing management. Both grass and legume forages progress through a couple different stages of growth, which are important for us to understand in order to provide the best quality forage possible for our livestock. The first stage that we'll talk about is the vegetative stage or the vegetative growth stage. And during this growth stage, the plants put on roots, leaves, and stem tissue. And this growth either aids in the capture of energy or in the storage of energy. Our leaves have the greatest nutritional value to our grazing livestock. And when we are looking at vegetative growth, what we wanna do is we want to manage for leaf tissue production and healthy root tissue. If we overgraze in our systems, what we do is we stress the root system. There's not an adequate storage of energy in the roots to allow for regrowth if we overgraze. If we undergraze, what we do in contrast is accelerate the entrance into the reproductive growth phase. And when the plants enter the reproductive phase of life, forage quality goes down because the energy allocation within the plant shifts from those vegetative structures to the reproductive structures. If we're able to implement a management intensive grazing plan of some type on our farm, it becomes easier for us to keep plants in the vegetative stage by the way we allow our animals to graze them. Typically that is accomplished by moving them on a frequent basis, depending on how fast grass is growing and how fast our animals are consuming the grass or the forage, the mixed stand, that's prepared for them on pasture. After the vegetative stage comes the reproductive stage of growth. Many forage crops have the ability to reproduce either by vegetative tissue spreading across the ground and or by the development of seed. The maturity rate at which our plants will reach that reproductive phase depends both on the plant type, its life cycle, and the environmental factors surrounding it. We do know that forage quality is best for livestock before plants enter that reproductive phase while they're in the vegetative stage. And that time at which we shift from vegetative to reproductive can be identified in grasses by the shift to boot stage. So the best time for high quality grass material occurs before the plant enters the boot stage which is where the seed begins to develop to develop and emerge from the leaf sheath. In legumes, the best time for a forage quality to be at its highest value is in bud to early bloom. Once the reproductive phase is reached and plants are fully allocating energy to reproductive tissues, 
what we see is a decline in forage quality that has to do both with the accumulation of fiber in the plant and where the energy is located. Instead of being in the leaves and stem tissue, it may now be present in the seed. And when we're grazing animals, it's more difficult to gather that energy from the seed heads than from the leafy tissue of the plant. It's key for the forage manager to try to find balance between yield and forage quality. Maximum quality is not equivalent to maximum yield and vice versa. When we look at how the nutrients are distributed throughout the plants and the preferences of animals grazing, we'll see that the most nutritious plants are those that are freshly growing. The newest growth on the plant is the most nutrient dense. But if we graze plants when they are too small to sustain the grazing activity, we can damage that root tissue. So what we want to do is shoot for a balance in the forage growth curve where we can have adequate yield to sustain our livestock, but also not breach into that area where forage quality begins to decline because of maturity. And so this depends on the various types of crops that we're growing. It also depends on the time of year, the amount of moisture that's present in the system. And so as we talk about these concepts, everything depends on those nuances of your specific system and are really as much of an art as they are a science when developing your grazing rotations. Now that we have a better understanding of some of the plant science behind how plants grow, let's talk some more about the key aspects of being a good pasture manager, because that involves understanding both the growth of the plants and the growth of our livestock. In order to be good pasture managers, we wanna make sure that we are allowing adequate space for our animals to graze, adequate rest for our forages to regrow. We need to make sure that if we're feeding supplemental feed or mineral that we're doing so in an area that avoids high waste accumulation. There are multiple issues that happen when animals are picking up bits of their own fecal material while they are eating. We want to avoid those issues. Those can include factors that contribute to illness and also parasites. Another factor that plays into that are grazing forages to the appropriate heights. This again helps avoid the accumulation or the contact of animals with their own feces while they're grazing. And it also enables the most healthy plant regrowth as possible because we're giving the plants a chance to regrow and replenish the energy that they have in their storage structures, typically in the root zone. And then we always wanna make sure we're providing access to clean water and free choice mineral that is species specific to the animals in our grazing systems. If we're able to do all of these things in conjunction, we should have happy animals and happy forages too. In order for us to meet the goals that were on the previous checklist, we need to be able to measure how much forage we have available and quantify that to what our animals actually need to consume. And there's many tools available out there to help us make these estimations. Something we'll refer to a lot going forward is our stocking density. And when we talk about stocking density, we're referring to the number of animals per unit of pasture. How can we figure that out? Well, we can figure that out by measuring our forage that's available on a given day, measuring in multiple places to figure out how much forage we have available, and we can take into account how much we expect our animals to eat based on their body weight. If we have both those pieces of information, we have the beginning pieces of our equation to determine how many animals can be housed on a specific unit of space and for how long. Some of the tools we have available to help us with this are forage guides, which are, which are available through OSU Extension, available online to help us learn more about the forages in our systems, how fast they grow, nutrient, re nutrient requirements, uh, and then also we have tools like a grazing stick, a pasture stick, which we can very practically take out into the field with us and get an estimation of dry matter. If you're not familiar with how to use a grazing stick, 
The QR code that's displayed on this slide will take you to a video that explains how to use a grazing stick. I encourage you to watch that so you can learn more. Some other tools we have are movable fence, which can give us additional flexibility on sizing pastures. And we also have ourselves a pair of clippers and a uniform sized square or circle that we could use to actually clip and weigh forage. And that could help us come up with an estimation of how much food is available for our animals to eat. As I mentioned, much of grazing rotations is an art and much of it is a science. So it's a combination of understanding how growth is playing together both in our livestock and our plants and how to make adjustments as time goes on. There are many options for how to set up grazing rotations depending on the resources available on your farm. Some of my colleagues within the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences put together the poster that you're seeing a picture of right now to display at Farm Science Review when we talk about grazing. And you can see on this poster six different examples of grazing layouts that allow for rotation on a frequent basis. The rotation that's gonna work best for you depends on your situation. But we're gonna walk through each of these examples and talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of each one. Some of the concerns to mark down or make note of when you're developing rotations on your own farm include how much fence you have available, what's feasible to be installed, permanent, movable, etc. We also need to think about how much water is available and where, because as I mentioned previously, our animals need access to clean, fresh water all the time. How are we going to provide that if we're breaking up our pastures into smaller units? That's a piece of the puzzle as well. We need to make sure we have the ability to offer that free choice mineral I mentioned earlier, and as well as the opportunity to offer supplemental feed to the animals in our pastures if need be. We also are gonna base our decisions on how many paddocks we need or small units of pasture in order to meet our animals' needs, depending on how much forage we have available. In our rest time, for those forages to grow back, the speed at which we move through the rotations also needs to be considered. We need to have enough spaces that animals can stay moving and allow rest from the paddock where they've moved from. So depending on how many days we need and how many animals we have, we may need to wait two weeks to 30 days before we return back to the pasture where we started. So there's a lot of different methods out there. There are many different designs and whichever one works best for your farm is likely to be different from what works best at your neighbors. But let's take a look at some of these examples. This first design is showing you an example in which there are two alleyways running from each of the grazing paddocks to the water source. So as you can see, wherever there are these solid lines, that is an example of a permanent fence. And what we see here is the construction of two alleyways both that lead to the water source. One of the advantages of setting up a, a design like this is that it does promote even grazing. We have a variety here of different grazing locations, uniform size that we can move on a regular basis. But some of the other things we see are we may have accumulation of manure in these alleyways, um, and we also are gonna see compaction in those alleyways as well. And so over time, that can cause uh, issues associated with erosion, where we may need to be installing a gravel or geotextile fabric uh, with gravel on top to maintain those alleyways. One of the benefits as well of this is it's fairly low labor cost because the animals, whichever pasture they're going to be in, will have access to that water source. So there's not a need for you to transport water to the animals. You also have permanent fence dividing all of these paddocks, and therefore you don't have to move fence. Uh, but along with the labor that it takes to move fence comes the freedom of flexibility. And we're going to look more at that in some additional examples. This next example is showing one alleyway in a system. So in this case, we have more paddocks than we started with, more small grazing units, than in the previous example, and thus we're installing more fence. 
We do have some uneven grazing in this situation because there is only one access point and thus animals will likely hang around the closest uh, way to access the alley and get to their water source. This again contributes to manure accumulation in the alley, but low labor costs. This is a good example for if you are bale grazing during the winter time, because you could set a bale in each one of these paddocks and that would help the animals spend time in those paddocks and reduce the time that they're spending traveling to the water source and hanging around the entrance of the alleyway. But this could work if you, again, only have one water source available. Our next example is the water truck method. And in this example, what we have are even paddocks of the same size divided by permanent fence. We actually have less fencing in this system than in the two prior. We have even distribution of grazing, even distribution of manure, but we do have some increased capital in the uh, acquisition of water that can be moved and the time it takes to move water. Because as you can see, there is no permanent water in any of these paddocks, and thus we will have to move it and make it available to the animal. So there's a lot of benefits to this type of system, but the disadvantage is the increased labor and thus increased capital investment to make it work. The next example that we'll look at is the pipeline method. And what we see in this example is four different water sources. And each of these water sources can be accessed from four different paddocks. So here we have 16 divisions with four water sources. This has many of the advantages of the previous example with not very much fence, with even, even fencing, good manure distribution, but this has again additional increased cost because we have the cost of installing four water tanks to supply these paddocks. But that could be worth the investment over time, and there's also funding opportunities uh, for many of these types of improvements uh, that could be applied for through NRCS, through your local soil and water conservation district to gradually improve systems over time. So it's not out of the question to have a design like this implemented on your farm. Another example that we have is this one that's being called the cell center. Often this is called the pinwheel design. And what we see in this example is a one water source in the center of all of the paddocks and each one branches out from that one water source. So in a way it's kind of similar to our alleyways um, but instead of one designated access point there's an access point from each paddock. This system has more miles of fencing incorporated than the others that we saw uh, but the biggest disadvantage with this one is uneven grazing. What we'll likely notice is the animals will spend most of their time in this inner circle close to the water source, and they'll spend less time out on the outer edges grazing this portion. And so we'll tend to have uneven distribution of manure, uneven grazing, but we have low labor costs because we don't have to move water, and it's fairly easy to go from one section to the next. The final design that we'll look at today is one that incorporates portable strip grazing. What we see in this example is one water source again with three lines of permanent fence. And then these dashed lines are indicating temporary fence or movable fence. And so in each of these four subdivisions, we see different sized strips. The beauty of using a movable fence, a temporary fence, is that Sizing can be adjusted uh, very easily, depending on the rate of growth, depending on the number of animals. If you have adjustments um, based on seasonality, uh, lambing or calving time in which you need to separate groups because of weaning, uh, those are all examples in which that flexibility may become adventitious for you. We have less cost installing a permanent fence, but we have more cost in portable fence. Um, we have the ability here to use the variability to our advantage. 
So the utilization of the forages in each one of these different strips may vary, but we also can vary the timing uh, both for the animals to be on pasture and the timing before we return to where we started. There is a higher labor cost associated with this type of a paddock design because we have to go out and move the fence. And um, we also have to continue to make sure that there's access to the water. So we will have back grazing in this system if we don't have additional ways to get to the water source. So the animals will have to travel through a portion they've already grazed on the way back. And thus we may have some uneven distribution um, of manure and some difficulties grazing the outskirts again. However, this is one that provides the most flexibility if you're still in the planning stages of what you want your farm to look like in the long term. This can help buy you time. It can also give you that seasonality flexibility, um, which can also be helpful in multi-species grazing situations as well. Next, we'll cover some information that can help you determine the appropriate stocking densities for those rotational units we just talked about. And we're gonna go through these separately, looking at the way that we can decide animal units based on animal weight and also on the needs of our forage crops. What we see on this chart is a definition of animal unit equivalence. So when you read publications on grazing, you may often see this animal unit equivalent term pop up. And what we're really talking about when you see that term is comparing animals of different classes, different species to determine stocking rates. Um, and so let's look at an example. If we have a cow here that weighs a thousand pounds, she's not lactating, this is a dry cow, her animal unit equivalent is one. Often you will hear that a good uh, stocking density to start with is one cow per acre. So if we take that idea moving forward, it's not always one cow per acre, but if we think of it in that term moving forward, we can decide that a cow is one animal. Well, bulls tend to be slightly larger than cows. So is a bull still equivalent to one cow? No, in this case, the animal unit equivalent is 1.5. So for every three cows, we could have two bulls in the same space. And this is based on estimated body weight and also consumption. We can look at this uh, as we change animal units from cow-calf pairs to young calves, uh, ewes and does, uh, weaned lambs and kids, and then even draft and saddle horses as well. So another example here, if we look at the needs of a draft horse, often our draft horses may be similar uh, in body weight to a mature cow, but the same size animal, when we're comparing cattle to horses, the horse is likely going to need more space. So as you can see, the draft horse animal unit equivalent here is 1.5, whereas a cow is one. So this can help us as we're making uh, comparisons across different examples. If you're looking at an example that's written for cattle, but you have sheep or goats, you can use the animal equivalent to try to get you a closer estimate. So in this case, what we see here is a uh, use and does that are not lactating have an animal unit equivalent of 0.2. So it would take five ewes or does to equate one cow. Now that's not the case in real life. If we know the actual body weight of our animals, we wouldn't need to use animal unit equivalents. We can just plug in the body weight and decide um, what our stocking density would be. But as we're planning things arbitrarily, animal units can be helpful for determining our, determining our stocking densities. Some guides that also apply for stocking density, going along with forage mass, our forage height, and the rest time that's needed for plants to regrow. We really don't know forage mass unless we do some type of a measurement, either with our grazing stick, with a clipped sample, with a rising plate meter, some device that helps us weigh the amount of forage that's available for our animals to graze. But if you're not able to weigh the forage, you don't have a grazing stick, you don't have the ability to clip a sample, you can make decisions based on the height of the forage. And while that may not tell us how much mass is there, 
it can help us with the determination on when to move animals either in or out of a grazing situation. What you'll see in this chart are some common beginning grazing and ending grazing heights for forages that we see a lot in the state of Ohio. And so that beginning grazing height, you could take that with a yardstick and decide now that my orchard grass pasture has reached a foot in growth, I'm gonna turn my animals in. But once they graze that down to four to eight inches, I'm gonna remove them and allow the stand to rest for 15 to 30 days. This is an estimate. Again, it depends on seasonality, depends on moisture, on how long it will take the plants to regrow, again, to that eight to 12 inch range. And so these are some um, additional guides for when you're gauging when to rotate animals. It can also help you with your stocking density as well. To revisit some of the things we wanna to do to make sure we're being a good pasture manager, include that we want to avoid overgrazing. We wanna also prevent back grazing if possible because animals will return to a tasty forage they found previously and eat it down to the ground and that doesn't give it its best chance for survival. So if we can avoid back grazing and keep our animals moving forward, that's more beneficial for our system. It's also best practice to allow our most sensitive animals to graze first, either the very young or the very old, or if we have animals that are more susceptible to parasites than others on our farm, if we allow them first access to the pasture, we'll likely have better results um, and overall better health. We may want to consider multi-species grazing because different animals have different grazing patterns. And when we combine them together for our advantage, we may be able to better utilize the forage that we have growing, and we may be able to hit additional markets as well when we go to sell our animals in the future. It's important to consider that alternative forages may have a place in our systems. We often will have forage gaps due to seasonality, but that doesn't mean there aren't options to help fill those gaps. So I encourage you to inquire about which alternative forages may work on your farm, and we'll share in additional information about how to find that at the end of this presentation. It's also important to provide supplemental feed when necessary. We may have a goal of keeping our animals on pasture 100% of the time, eating the forage that's growing out there, but occasionally the weather <laughs> may have a different opinion than we do and prohibit that ability. But being prepared and having the ability to provide supplemental feed for the health of our animals is something we should consider and be prepared for as well. We wanna make sure we're monitoring animal and plant success throughout the entire growing season and making adjustments as needed. And then finally, if we find that we have animals or forages that simply don't fit our management style, we may want to cull those out of our system. Don't keep animals that don't fit your management style. And the same goes for forages as well. You'll wanna choose forages that fit the way you manage and you'll wanna choose animals that fit your management style as well. If this is your first season becoming a grazing manager, you may be asking yourself this question. I'm starting from scratch. What forages do I choose and how do I plant them? Well, I'm happy to tell you that we have some additional episodes of Forage Focus that address those questions. And if you'd like to scan the QR code, or browse uh, through our other Forage Focus videos available um, through our OSU Extension YouTube pages, you're welcome to do that or contact uh, your local Extension professional for one-on-one -on -one assistance. Because as I mentioned previously, what works best for your neighbor may not work best for you. And the best place to start if you're starting from scratch is with a soil test. Soil testing should always be your first step before planting a new crop. If you have additional questions after watching this episode of Forage Focus, feel free to reach out to me, Christine Gelly, at the Noble County OSU Extension Office. You can reach me by phone or by email. I'd be happy to talk more with you about these concepts or direct you to the professional that's closest to your location. There's also a wide variety of information available on our other Extension websites, which include our forages, our beef, and our sheep teams. You can access those web pages at the links that are shown on the screen. 
to find additional articles of interest that pertains to the interest you have on your farm. You can also connect with other professionals in the OSU Extension Network by exploring those pages. If you're eager to learn more about how your pastures can be profitable for you on farm, we encourage you to attend our Pastures for Profit course this spring. We are offering it completely online. You are welcome to enroll and participate from your home. And the registration information is located here on the screen. If you're watching this episode at a later date, please reach out to us on the Forages team to inquire about the next course offering. This course is all encompassing of the main factors to be considered in pasture management for a multitude of species. And we would love to connect you with those resources. So if you're interested in pastures for profit, be sure to scan the QR code here to find out more about registration.